Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's dive right in. Just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, undergrads, you're working on the very last of the 10 assignments. This coming Tuesday, we'll talk about the final project and what you'll be doing with the remainder uh, of the semester in this course. Graduate students, you're carrying on with weekly deliverables. We talked last time about trying to break this down into weekly uh, milestones. I gave you some strategic uh, advice about how to do that. Any questions about assignments, final projects, weekly milestones? Going once, going twice. Okay, a couple other things uh, that are happening today. Um, as we speak, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom, there is an embodied intelligence conference that's going on uh, right now. Uh, you can check it out after class if you like at embodied intelligence.org. It's free registration, so if you've got uh, nothing else to do this morning, you can head over to embodied intelligence.org, register, or just hop directly on Zoom and put in the meeting ID uh, and the passcode. And here's a program of what happened yesterday, the 22nd of March. Uh, here's what's happening today. This is a conference that's taking place uh, in the UK, so they're in Greenwich Mean Time, which at the moment is four hours ahead of us. Uh, you will notice today at 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, which is 10 a.m. our time, so just after class, uh, I will be speaking in this conference. So we're going to finish right at 9.45. I'm going to run out of here, run in my office, which is behind this wall, and teleport to the UK to give my talk. Uh, some interesting speakers, other than myself, of course, uh, at the conference, all talking about things that, uh, at least to some degree, that we've already touched on in this course. Um, there's some roboticists at this conference, neuroscientists, uh, developmental psychologists, those who study how children uh, develop into adults. Uh, very interesting. There's a YouTube. Uh, there's a YouTube live live stream as well. They captured all the uh, talks from yesterday as well, doing the same thing today and also uh, tomorrow. So it might be fun to to check out. Uh, for those of you that re are really keen, you can hop on at 5:30 tomorrow morning and catch the morning session tomorrow. Yes. What are you, uh, are you going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about something called morphological pre-training, which we haven't talked about in this course yet. But given what we've talked about so far, you should be able to pick it up, no problem. Yeah. OK. Until then, uh, back to CS 206. We're working our way through challenges uh, in the course. Uh, we talked last time about modularity, or the problem, which is the evolution of non-modularity. How do we get evolution to evolve not just useful machines, but also modular machines? Machines in which we, or evolution, can swap out parts through mutation and recombination and swap in other parts. We started last time by talking, uh, we started last time in lecture 14 by talking about a separate problem which is known in the literature as the, uh, the competing conventions problem. Just as a reminder, taking a step back, this is the idea that we're evolving populations of networks or populations of machines, but inside those neural networks or inside the machines, they may be evolving to solve subproblems, but they may be evolving partial solutions to those subproblems at different places inside their bodies or inside their neural networks, right? A PC and a Mac both have good solutions to various problems like storage, power, compute, and so on. But the solutions to those problems in a Mac and a PC, the CPU, the disk drive, memory, and so on, they're at different locations. One of the things that we would like to do with, a pop with evolving populations of neural networks or evolving populations of machines is being able not just to mutate machines or neural networks, but also recombine them be able to pull them apart, assuming that they're modular, and take those parts from different parents and glue those parts together in random ways to create a new child neural network, and increase the probability that sometimes that recombination uh, method is going to combine into the child good sub-solutions from different parents. 
Yeah, that's what we would like to do. That's why sex evolved uh, in higher animals. It's a very useful. Uh, it's a very useful technique. So the problem here is kind of a lost opportunity. Up until uh, when this, uh, up until about 2001, this problem was unsolved. This is a partial solution to this problem. Everything we're seeing in this section is a partial solution to a given problem. Yeah. Okay, so we looked at the competing conventions problem last time, and I gave you this kind of cartoon example here. If I give you these two networks, and you have to cut both of them and find a way to try and glue the parts together, there is no way to cut it apart, so you get good A and good B. Let's assume parent one has evolved a good solution to A and B. To combine A and B with good C from parent two, assuming that parent two has evolved to compute a pretty good solution to subproblem C. So far, so good. Everyone clear on the problem? All right, let's have a look at the solution. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through what is known as the, uh, the NEAT algorithm. So the authors of this paper that we're drawing this from were a little clever here. Their algorithm is kind of neat. It stands for uh, neural, uh, uh, oh, it's not here in the title, and it's not on this slide. Hopefully, I, oh, here it is, yeah, right. It had to be here somewhere. Neuroevolution, so we're evolving neural networks. This is often known as neuroevolution for short. So we're gonna be evolving neural networks of augmenting topologies, or NEAT. So what do we mean by topology? In this course, we've been referring to topology as the cognitive architecture. It's the way, the number of neurons and how those neurons are wired up, yeah? So you can see the topology or the cognitive architecture of this network, the number of neurons and how they're wired up is different from the cognitive architecture of this neural network. These two neural networks and pretty much every neural network on the planet at the moment works kind of the same way. We supply values to the inputs and they flow from the inputs through hidden layers to the outputs. That's usually the same across all different kinds of neural networks, but neural networks have different cognitive architectures or different topologies. It means the same thing. Okay, last word in NEAT. What do we mean by augmenting topologies? Um, someone was asking uh, last class about how do we allow evolution to add and remove neurons or add and remove synapses? How do we turn over the problem of deciding on the architecture of the neural network from us humans to AI, which in our case is an evolutionary algorithm? That's something you're going to see in this neat algorithm, which also, by the way, happens to solve the competing conventions problem. Yeah. Okay, so how does this work? In the NEAT algorithm, it's not too different from uh, what we've been doing so far. We're gonna have a population of evolving neural networks. And we're going to encode these neural networks, not in a single vector, which is what you have in your code at the moment. You have a single vector with all your synaptic weights in it. In the NEAT algorithm, each neural network is encoded using two vectors or two data structures. The first network is going to, the, sorry, the first uh, vector is going to encode information about the nodes or neurons. They use the word node here, we use the word neurons. The second vector is going to encode information about the connections or the synapses. This is sort of the vector that you have at the moment in your code. Yeah? Okay. For each node in the neural network and each connection that connects pairs of nodes or neurons together. They have not just the weight of that connection, as you see here, but some additional information. And we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah? So in the NEAT algorithm, we have a population of vector pairs. Here's one of them. But remember, we always have a population of evolving things. When we go to evaluate the fitness of one of these neural networks, we take these two vectors we use it to construct a neural network. We flow values through the neural network, and as we'll see later, put that network in a robot, evaluate the fitness of the robot, and the number that comes back, the fitness, the single number that comes back is assigned to the genotype that encoded the network, which is the phenotype. Yeah. 
You may remember from our lecture way back on evolutionary algorithms. Uh, evolutionary algorithms, like in biological evolution, we have a genotype, which is the blueprint, the instructions that, that store how to build or how to define the thing, the phenotype, right? We are the phenotype. Your DNA is your genotype. Here, the genotype in the NEAT algorithm is a pair of vectors. So far, so good? Okay, let's have a look at the node vector uh, first. Um, the length of this vector basically dictates how many neurons are in the neural network. This is the first time we've seen a genotype in which the length of the vector can actually grow and shrink over evolutionary time, right? At the moment, you have a fixed uh, vector. You've got, I forget now how many uh, sensors and motors you have in your robot. However many sensors and motors you have, it's S times N, uh, uh, S times N sen uh, synaptic weights that you have encoded. That vector doesn't change in length while you're running the evolutionary algorithm. Here, we're going to see evolution add and remove neurons to these evolving neural networks. So the length of the node vector is going to grow and shrink over evolutionary time. And we'll see how that happens in a moment. Yeah. In this example here, this genotype encodes five neurons. So you can see the phenotype here. The neural network has five neurons in it. In each element of this vector, there is also a flag that indicates what type of neuron it is. Is it a sensor neuron? Is it a hidden neuron? Is it an output neuron? So evolution can also tinker with not just the number of neurons, but the types and distribution of neuron types. So far, so good? Okay, next vector, the connections or synapse uh, vector, however long this is, this is the number of synapses that are encoded in the genome. You'll notice that for every synapse, in this case there are six encoded synapses, we have two integers that reference into the neuron vector. Yeah? So this first synapse connects node one with node four, that's this synapse here. The second synapse connects neuron two to neuron four. We can see that synapse here and so on. Yeah? So the, geno the genotype is basically encoding a wiring diagram. Connect this neuron to this neuron, then this neuron to this neuron, and so on. You'll notice uh, the next set of numbers encoded in this vector is the weight of the synapse. This should be very familiar to you. There is a binary flag also, which indicates whether the synapse is enabled or disabled. Yeah. So you'll notice that in the genome, there are six synapses. But in the, uh, in the phenotype, there's only one, two, three, four, five synapses. One of them, this synapse, has been disabled. Yeah. As we're gonna see in a moment, once we start looking at the evolution of these vector pairs, mutations can hit at various places inside either of these vectors, and a mutation that hits, for example, the enabled flag in the second synapse can flip that synapse from enabled to disabled. Or alternatively, a mutation might randomly hit the enabled flag in the third synapse and switch that synapse from enabled to disabled. This seems kind of odd. Seems like kind of an additional complication. Why put this in? Any ideas? A lot of obviously what we're looking at in this course is bio-inspired AI. These algorithms are coming from things we observe in nature. I think it's kind of like dominant or recessive genes where you have like, um, like genes that are still like present, but not like expressing themselves in the uh, phenotype. Exactly. So if we go back to high school biology, you might remember the discussion of alleles, dominant alleles, re recessive alleles. If you have two alleles, one dominant and one uh, recessive, whatever is encoded in the dominant gene, that's what happens, right? If uh, blue, I forget what it is, blue eyes is dominant or brown eyes is dominant, and you have green eyes is recessive, you're gonna have blue eyes, right? It, it sort of shields the recessive allele, and it's in the genome, it's in there, it's in your DNA, but it doesn't get expressed in the phenotype. Question? Yeah, 
So a, a gene, for us, a diploid species, diploid means that for every gene, there's two copies of the gene, two versions, and those versions are called alleles, right? So I, there's a gene for eye color, and you have two alleles for that, right? Could be blue, 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 brown, blue, green, green, green. And typically, in our genes, one of those alleles is dominant and the other one is recessive. It isn't that both are expressed. Yeah? So that's an example. Recessive alleles are an example of something that's encoded in the genome that doesn't make it into the phenotype. You may remember from high school or, or bio 101, there is also a lot of other material in your genome that doesn't seem to be expressed in your phenotype. This was a huge mystery in the 90s and, and still somewhat today, often not referred to as junk DNA. It seems like there's a lot of stuff in our DNA that is junk. It doesn't seem to do anything. As always in biology, things are complicated, so it's, it's probably the fact that junk DNA is doing something. It might not directly have an impact on the phenotype, but uh, it might not directly have an impact on the phenotype, maybe indirectly. But you can also make an argument sometimes for why genetic material is not expressed in the phenotype. Anybody remember hearing an argument for why that might be the case? Why might junk DNA be useful in the long run? I don't know if this is the same thing, but like um, they're talking about like telomeres, where it's just like it's useful to have for the um, purpose of like reproduction, where it's like you break if you break some of them, it won't destroy the whole thing. Like it's kind of like a like a safety thing. It's a pretty right. Telomeres, they are junk DNA. They don't seem to code for anything. It looks like they're kind of a shield or a protection for certain operations. Yeah. Other ideas? And you can still pass them down to your offspring. You can pass junk DNA, things that aren't encoding for anything to your offspring. Well, why would that be useful? Why, why give seemingly useful, useless genetic material to your offspring? Now they're carrying the junk DNA. There are arguments you can make that junk DNA uh, tends to code for genes that were expressed in our ancestors in the past. So in the past, that gene was turned on. It was enabled. It's been turned off. If it's turned off, by definition, if genetic material inside uh, the junk DNA is mutated, it has no effect on the phenotype because it's junk DNA. It doesn't affect the phenotype. It's possible that uh, in a given part of inactivated genetic material, one mutation is a bad thing, but maybe there's a combination of mutations that can happen that if that gene is then turned back on and has those two mutations, now it's even more useful to your offspring than that original gene was for your ancestors. Yeah? So some of you may have done this in learning to code is you comment out part of your code and sometimes you play around with the commented out code. You're trying out ideas. You make some change to the commented out code. You're sort of trying out an idea. It doesn't matter if you run your code. It's commented out code. It doesn't affect the running of your code. You look at the change you've made. You realize you've actually made things worse. But it leads you to a new idea. You make a second change inside your commented out code. Now you've got an idea that this is going to be really useful. You uncomment the code and your code still crashes because, of course, it's not, never two, right? It's three and then 10 and then 100. Not only we, but Mother Nature seems to do this as well. She seems to benefit from having this scratch pad where any, if, if there was no such thing as junk DNA, that means anywhere that she touches through mutation or sexual recombination, any change to the genetic material is going to have an impact on the organism, right? That's kind of a dangerous situation. Maybe it's useful to have a scratch pad. Anyways, it's a bit of a digression into the theory of evolutionary biology. Question? Yeah, so would you say it's been solved or still kind of people are still on the fence about it? Yeah, uh, yeah it, not that it's on the fence. There's data for and against it. There's data that suggests maybe nothing is actually junk DNA. You mentioned telomeres, which for a long time it wasn't clear what they did. Maybe, again, it's just us stupid humans. Maybe we haven't figured out yet what it does. Or alternatively, it really is 
not for anything useful in the current organism, but in the longer evolutionary view, it is actually useful, right? There's evidence sort of for both. And in biology, the answer is usually it's all of the above, right? Okay, sorry, a bit of a digression, but you can see that at work here. You can see that in this disabled synapse, if we imagine that this particular neural network gets high enough fitness that it produces offspring, and in those offspring, a mutation changes the weight of this disabled synapse, it has no influence on the child neural network. It has no influence on the behavior of the child neural network. Whether that's useful or not here, it's not, not really clear. Yeah? Okay, there is one last integer stored uh, uh, alongside each synapse, which is called the innovation number, inno for short here. We'll come back to the innovation number in a moment. Yeah? Okay, so we now, have, we now have this neural network, which is either a 2D structure or a graph structure. We're kind of flattening it into uh, two vectors in this case. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to ignore the neuron vector, and we're only going to look at the synapse vector. So in this little cartoon here, we now have two parent networks, and I'm only showing you the synapse vector for this network and the synapse vector for this network. You can see in this particular child here, or in this particular parent, we have one, two, three, four synapses, and we have one, two, three, four enabled synapses, and a fifth piece of junk DNA synapse riding along. This parent over here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five enabled synapses, and one disabled synapse. You'll notice, uh, you'll notice that these two parents uh, have different structure. In the NEAT algorithm, there are now two different ways in which during evolutionary time, evolution can change the neural networks. As usual, it can change the neural networks through mutation. So some part, one, one element in this vector is chosen at random, and something inside that element is changed at random. That's mutation. Here's one example. In this particular case here, we have this neural network. And assume that it creates a copy of itself. Oh, I'm sorry. I described these as two parents. I'm getting ahead of myself. We haven't got to sex yet. Back to one parent. We have one parent here with four synapses. Assume that this neural network had a high enough fitness value that it survives and produces an offspring. Here's the offspring. We copy this, uh, we copy the genome, and then a mutation can change values in the vector or add a new element to the vector. Yeah? This is the first time in this course we've seen evolution where we, I promised you at the beginning of this course, we're going to see the evolutionary algorithms broaden their reach. They're going to be able to tinker with more things other than just, just the synaptic weights of a fixed neural network inside a fixed body of a robot. Right? Here we're starting to see this widening. So in this example, uh, a random new synapse has been added, synapse 7 here. And synapse 7, just randomly, we throw in some random integers, 3 and 4, that ends up connecting neuron three to neuron four with the synapse. There's also some random floating point value in here, which is the synaptic weight for this new synapse. And we now have changed, evolution has changed the cognitive architecture of this neural network. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, down here, uh, let's see. Down here, we have another mutation operator. I promised you that we're, I'm now hiding the, the node vector, so you can't see the node vector being added to, or you can't see the, this new node being added by mutation to the node vector, but it's there. This particular parent produces this child. A mutation comes in and adds a new element to the node vector. It adds a new neuron, which is neuron uh, 6. And in this case, uh, we are also adding, or the mutation added two new synapses, synapse eight and synapse nine, which randomly connect 
neuron three to this new neuron six, and ran, we ran that we picked some new random integers. They happen to connect neuron six to neuron five. Yeah. So you can imagine over evolutionary time, mutations are hitting either the node or the synapse vector, and they're adding or possibly deleting nodes and synapses. That's mutation, right? One parent, one child. Okay, you can probably guess where this is going. This is all leading up to crossover, the, the, introduction, the introduction of sex to an evolutionary algorithm. Here's our two parents, parent one and parent two. Here's the phenotype, the neural network, and here's its genotype, the thing that encodes it. Again, I'm just showing you, uh, I'm just showing you the two vectors that encode them. You'll see that these two parents obviously have very different cognitive architectures. Now it's really difficult to see how would we cut or where would we cut these two parents so that we could pull out these two parts one part from each parent and glue them together and hope that we get a neural network that not only works, but maybe is better than both parents because it inherits the best of both worlds, right? We've got the Mac on one side and the PC on the other. How the heck do you know how to cut these two machines and glue them together to produce a machine that inherits the best of Macs and the best of PCs? Yeah? It almost sounds impossible, right? Not, turns out it's not impossible. It happens in nature and this algorithm tends to solve it. How does it solve it? Well, it solves it first of all by cutting not the networks themselves, but these two vectors. We have two vectors of different lengths. We just cut them and glue the two parts of the two vectors together, which makes the neat algorithm algorithmically simple. Right? We don't have to move through this graph and snip various connections and remember where we snipped connections, snip another network, figure out which edge to connect to which other edge. Just cut two vectors, glue the parts together. Algorithmically simple. Okay, that's one thing. But the much, much harder thing is we want to increase the probability that when that happens, it produces children that are similar to the parents. What do we mean by similar here? Similar could mean a lot of things in this context. What? What do you think is similar here? We'll walk through this cartoon example in a moment, but you can probably already see what we mean by similarity here. There's the two parent networks at the top, the one child network at the bottom. What's similar? Not identical to the parents, we don't want a child that's identical to the parents, that's mutation. We want children that are similar to, but not identical to their parents. If we're lucky, the children are going to uh, outperform the parents. Similar structure or similar cognitive architecture or similar topology, these all mean the same thing. So visually, hopefully, you can see uh, you can see here that the number and connectivity among the neurons is similar in this parent, uh, in this child, to the two parents. Not quite the same. That's one thing that's important. We'd like the architecture to be similar. We'd like the form, to be, we'd like the children to have similar form to their parents. But even more important than similar form, we want similar Sorry? Connections. Con connections, th that's what we mean by form here. Connections and neurons. We want them to look this similar, have similar structure. But more importantly, performance. similar performance. We want the behavior of this network to be similar to the behavior of the two parents. If we push sets of values through the two parents and the child, we want the numbers arriving at the output layer, which in this case is just a single output neuron here, neuron five, in the parents and the child. We want the value arriving to be similar, right? If these two parents are trying to compute the exclusive OR function, then of course we would like the child to also kind of compute the XOR function and hopefully 
do a better job at computing the XOR function than either parent. So far, so good? Okay. This cartoon picture doesn't show us anything about whether or not the child is similar in, similar in function. It only shows us that it's similar in form. Yeah? Okay. So let's do it. Let's see how this works. Uh, we've got parent one up here, five synapses, one of them disabled. Parent two, we have seven synapses up here, two of them disabled. We're going to take these two vectors which have different lengths and we're going to try and line them up and align them. Yeah? What do I mean by align them? We're going to put the leftmost element from parent one right up against the leftmost element in parent two. And what we're looking for is for this innovation number, which I mentioned a few slides back, this innovation number to be the same in both parents. So parent one has a synapse with innovation number one, and parent two also has an innovation number of one. I haven't told you where these innovation numbers are coming from yet. For our purposes, I want you to assume that the innovation number is kind of a signal saying this synapse is similar to this synapse. Yeah? If I open up my Mac and my PC, if I'm, if I'm knowledgeable enough, I can look and there's some visual marking that'll tell me, ah, here's the CPU in the Mac, and oh, over here is the CPU in the uh, PC. So if I'm gonna cut these two machines in half and hope that they're gonna do a good job, I'm gonna try and line up the, I, I don't want two CPUs going into one machine or zero CPUs going into one machine. I'm gonna pick either the Mac CPU or the PC CPU. I want exactly one copy from these two to arrive into the child. So far, so good. So in, the innovation number is kind of telling us that the synapse in parent one is doing more or less what the synapse in parent two is doing. So far, so good. Okay, so there is, an, there is a synapse, I'm just, from now on I'm just gonna say synapse one, synapse three, synapse seven. And what I mean by that is the synapse with innovation number one, the synapse with innovation number two, and so on, yeah? So there's a synapse one in parent one, there's a synapse one in parent two, great. I line those up. I move on to the next element in parent two. In parent two, the next synapse has an innovation number of two. So I look to see in parent two, is there a synapse in parent two that has an innovation number of two? There is, so I line those ones up. I move on uh, in parent three, there's a synapse of innovation number three, but there is no corresponding synapse in parent one that also has an innovation number of three. So I leave a blank spot. I cut parent one between two and four and pull them apart. Yeah. I now move on to four. There's a copy of four in both parents. I line them up. There's an innovation number of five in one parent, but not an a synapse five in the other parent. So I leave the five slot blank in parent two and I keep going. So far, so good. Okay, so I'm lining up these connection genes according to these innovation numbers, and now let's talk about what these innovation numbers are. These are historical markings. Okay, what do I mean by historical markings? Remember at the beginning of evolution, every evolutionary algorithm, we create a population of random neural networks. We create a bunch of nodes and we wire them up randomly with synapses and we assign those synapses random weights. We go on to the next random neural network, create neurons and synapses, wire them up and keep going. As we're constructing this initial random population of neural networks, we have a global counter in the NEAT algorithm. At the very beginning, when we start running the NEAT algorithm, that global counter has a value of one. The very first random synapse that we create gets a, an innovation number of one. We update our global counter to two. The, the next synapse that we create gets an innovation number of two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've made my first random neural network. It's got seven random synapses in it. 
They have an innovation number of one through seven. I go on to construct the second random neural network in the population. My global counter is now at eight. The first synapse that I create in the second neural network gets an innovation number of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and so on. When I'm finished creating this initial random population of neural networks, no synapse in that entire population has any other counterpart. They're all unique and independent. Yeah, so far so good? Okay, that's generation zero. Some survive into generation one. Let's take one hypothetical neural network that happened to survive this first generation and it produces two children through mutation. Yeah, two children. We take that neural network and we create two identical copies, which are gonna be the two children. And when we copy the synapses from the parent into child one and child two, all of the synapses in the, in the two children inherit the innovation numbers from their parent. So far, so good. Tell me about these two sibling neural networks, which are now sitting in generation one. We haven't evaluated them yet, but they're sitting in there. They're identical at the moment, right? We've just copied the parents in. Now we go in with mutations and we change a few things, change the weight of a synapse, add a neuron here or there. So you're right, the two sibling neural networks don't necessarily have identical cognitive architecture anymore. What else? That's what's different among the two sibling networks. What's identical between them? Or what's similar between them? Maybe not identical. Tell me about their synapses. They'll be marked with the same historical markings. They'll be marked with the same historical markings. As I said, we're copying the synapses from the parent into two children, and the children inherit those innovation numbers. Yeah, they're, we're not assigning innovation values from the global counter. They inherit from their parents. So. The ith synapse in child one and the ith synapse in child two, they have the same innovation number. They're probably located more or less in the same position in uh, the two siblings. Maybe not identical, but similar positions, which means they're also probably helping with the computing the same subfunction. So far, so good? Okay. So, uh, as far as I know, there's no siblings in this class, but somewhere in our distant evolutionary past, we share a common ancestor, and inside all of our respective genomes, there are genes that do similar things, like encode for eye color. Guess what? The gene in you that encodes for eye color and the gene in me that encodes for eye color, they're at similar locations, in our two respective genomes, yeah? Okay, two parents that produce a, a child through sex, their genetic material is combined. How does, uh, how do all of the mechanisms that combine genetic material from two parents in nature, how do they know not to put two genes for eye color in one child and no genes for eye color in a second child? because they happen to be located in similar places. And there are also tags in the genome that indicate this is who I am or what I encode for. And there are similar markings in the other parent, in the other parental organism. Yeah? That's what the innovation number is. So far, so good. That's the, the main innovation, pun intended. That's the main innovent, innovation in the NEAT algorithm. We're cutting two machines in half and trying to glue them together. How do we know not to put two copies from both machines into one child machine and no copies into the other? We allow them to inherit these innovation numbers. So over evolutionary time, we have a hint about who does what in the genome. So does that mean that the synapses three, five, seven, and eight were created through mutation? Three, five, seven, and eight, uh, possibly. Or they're coming from, uh, or they were inherited from another parent that had that had a mutation that produced a new synapse. 
it's not perfect, right? And because again, we want to allow new things to evolve in the population, new neurons, new synapses, new neural modules. Remember our discussion about modularity on Tuesday? We want new stuff to evolve. So we're giving a little bit of, of freedom here for new stuff to come in. And yes, this might have arisen through uh, mutation. Okay, so far so good. So we've lined everything up. We've got genes that have uh, two versions, going back to our discussion about alleles, you can now actually think about these as alleles. They're two different genes that encode, presumably, for more or less the same thing. Yeah? So we're now going to create our offspring network by walking from left to right along these two aligned vectors. And wherever there are two copies uh, of the gene, wherever there's matching genes, we're going to flip a coin. We're going to select a random number. Heads, copy parent one's version into the offspring. Tails, copy parent two's version into the offspring. Yeah? It's pretty much what happens, again, during meiosis. Two parents producing a child. You randomly get one copy of the gene that encodes for eye color from a parent. Yeah? OK. Then we get to disjoint genes here. So these are synapses that exist in one parent. So if we go to parent two, uh, this says it connects three to four. So there's a synapse that connects neuron three to four. But there is no corresponding, there is no corresponding synapse that connects three to four in parent one. What do we do in that case? Uh, we again flip a coin. Heads, we copy the disjoint gene into the parent. Tails. We skip it. We don't include anything, and we move on to innovation, the next innovation number, or the next set of values. Yeah? We can also get excess genes. So some parents encode for more synapses than others. So at some point, as we're reading from left to right, we run out of genetic material from one parent. We keep reading the genetic material from, in this case, parent two. We keep flipping coins. Maybe we include information. Maybe we don't. So far, so good. Okay, last detail about uh, last detail about uh, about the innovation number and historical markings here. We may have, for example, we may have two copies of a synapse in both parents. Do you think that the synaptic weights of synapse six in both parents are identical? Do they have to be identical? Not necessarily, right? So going back to my example of the two sibling uh, children, they, when, we when we copied from the parent, yes, at that point, they both had a synapse with innovation number I, and that those two genes had exactly the same synaptic weight. But maybe one sibling, uh, a mutation, hit that synapse and changed that weight a little bit. That si the second sibling produced three children of its own, they inherited that gene, they also got hit by mutations. So over time, those two genes, or that, that set of genes, is gonna have, might have many different versions in the evolving population, and that gene may encode for synapses that have slightly different weights and do slightly different things in the neural network. Yeah, so far so good? Okay, uh, question. The, yeah, the innovation number. So the first generation, at the beginning, we're going to create random neural networks, and we're going to cr randomly connect pairs of neurons together. Every time we do, we're creating a new random synapse. In our code, there's a global counter. So the global counter starts with one. So we take that number one, and we assign it as the innovation number to that synapse. Next synapse, two, three, four, five, six. The beginning, everybody has their own innovation number. All the synapses are unique. But as evolution proceeds, if a neural network survives through the generation and is producing children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they're inheriting the cognitive architecture from their parents. They're inheriting the synapses. And those synapses are going to have the same innovation numbers in the parents, uh, in the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, as the parent, the ancestor that gave them that gene in the first place. So if those, dis, those great, great, great grandchildren become parents and produce offspring of their own, we're not going to put two copies of that same synapse into the child. We'll pick 
one copy. Make sense? So if you have like two um, like tabs that branch off from like a single parent and they get really dissimilar and they keep adding like new um, neurons, yep. or synapses I mean, yep. with like different identification numbers. Yep. Um, when when you add them together again, you just get like a really long like genome and like Great question. Yeah. So so what happens if you take two parents that are very different and you combine them together, you'll tend to get a child which is as you said, much, much larger, or at least looks very different from either parent, right? Th this happens in nature all the time. There are closely related species that will actually attempt to have sex with one another, but doesn't produce any children, because whatever is going on in, in the womb, the, the, the sperm and the egg, it's too different. It may fuse and it may start an embryo. That embryo is non-viable. Happens all the time. Right? Mother Nature is figuring out, if I take genetic material from these two parents and put them together, is it something that survives? Sex is very useful, but it's not guaranteed. Yeah? It can produce what used to be known in the literature as hopeful monsters. So something that looks like it might work. You're, you're bringing together genetic material from two very different things, two very different parents, and the hopeful in the hopeful monster is they're going to combine material from two very different sources to produce something new. I'm gonna cut my Mac and my PC together. I'm gonna to hope that I'm gonna glue them together and create a computer that's better than either company and become obscenely wealthy. Pretty unlikely, yeah? Doesn't, doesn't happen all the time. It's a, it's a miracle that it happens at all. And it's a miracle in nature and I'm not going to show you the data for the NEAT algorithm. This was published back in 2001 and, and basically blew the field wide open because it works. You can now not have to worry about figuring out how to wire up neural networks. The NEAT algorithm will figure it out for you. This became the standard in the field for about 10, 12 years until the deep learning revolution started and then sort of killed off all this stuff. But this basic idea of being able to combine material from very different machines is still alive. Maybe not for neural networks. We'll see it a little bit later for uh, robots. Yes? Hey, I hate to put you on the spot, but do right. you have an example from nature of like two slightly different species? Good question. Um, it's, it's the ass, right? If a donkey and a horse mate, they produce an ass, but if the ass mates, it can't produce any offspring. Yeah. I know it's those three species, but I forget which is which. Yeah, yeah. yeah? I think you have it, yeah. That, did I have it right? Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay, I think that's it, yeah? Okay. All right, so again, I'm not gonna show you any data, but it turns out, as you can see in this cartoon example, the NEAT algorithm tends to produce children that have similar topology or similar cognitive architecture, and this, these children often will compute similar functions. And more often than you might think, this, the, these recombination events that occur during a population, evolving population of neural networks, they produce children through this recombination event where the child gets higher fitness than either of the parents. Yeah. Okay, I am gonna show you some data of that happening, but we're gonna talk about another algorithm first and then kind of come back to this. So far, so good? Okay, so we started with the competing conventions problem. We not only solved the competing conventions problem, but we solved another problem, which is how do we get evolution to decide on a good cognitive architecture for our neural network? This is actually still something that's explored in, uh, uh, in deep learning and lots of other branches of AI, which is known as architecture search, architecture search. So if you played around with ChatGPT lately or, or stable diffusion, somewhere in there, there's a massive neural network with billions of neurons and billions, tens of, possibly tens of billions of synapses. Who decided on the cognitive architecture for it? Wasn't, wasn't a machine learning algorithm. It was someone or a group of people at OpenAI that decide, determined the architecture and hoped for the best, and at least it seemed it kind of worked out for them. Yeah. 
maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe there's a better way to search for good cognitive architectures. So this is also still an open problem in AI in general. So far, so good? OK, we're going to switch and talk about another algorithm now called HyperNeat. And as the name implies, it's an add-on. It's a twist on the NEAT algorithm. HyperNeat was de designed to de uh, solve a different problem, which is regularity. So we've talked about, we talked about modularity uh, already. And the problem is that when we use an evolutionary algorithm, it tends to produce non-modular solutions. When we look at nature, we tend to see modularity. I can move my arms without influencing the rest of my body. I can turn my head without influencing the rest of our, my body. Our bodies and our brains are modular. They also have regular structure. Various kinds of regularities exist in nature, like symmetry. The left side of our bodies look like the right side of our bodies. We talked about why that type of regularity exists in animals that need to move from point A to point B. Symmetry, a type of regularity, is helpful for behavior, like legged locomotion. Also, lots of other different kinds of regularity, like repetition. So if you look at uh, centipedes and snakes, they have a lot of repeated segments in them. Your spinal cord has a lot of repeated segments in them. Once you come up with a good module, it's often a good idea to repeat that module regularly over space, right? So if, as you'll see when we start to look at evolving robot bodies and brains, you tend to get things that aren't regular. So if you look at these three networks, for example, there's no symmetry here. The left side of the network doesn't look like the right side of the natural network. There's no repetition. There isn't a bunch of neural modules that have been copied and used for other things. So one of the problems in the field is when we evolve things like neural networks uh, and robots, they tend to be sort of, they have no regularity to them. There's no rhyme or reason to the structure or function of them. So HyperNeat, which we'll talk about now, is an algorithm that forces evolution to produce modular and regular structures. How does HyperNeat do this? Well, you can see I've got a little cartoon picture here. HyperNeat does this by evolving very specific kinds of networks, and it evolves those specific kinds of networks using NEAT. That's where the NEAT in HyperNeat comes in. Yeah? So in HyperNeat, like everything else, most of everything we've seen so far in this course, HyperNeat evolves populations of neural networks, and those neural networks are being evolved with the NEAT algorithm. Okay. Let's talk about what these networks look like in NEAT. They're referred to as CPPNs. You remember we talked about CTRNNs before. CPPNs have nothing to do with CTRNNs. They're completely different. Bit of a mouthful here. They're called pa compositional pattern producing networks. We're going to do an example here at the board uh, to give you to, to sort of show you how these CPPNs work. Imagine I want to create not, an, I want to evolve not a neural network. I don't want to evolve a robot. I want to evolve pretty pictures. We're going to evolve pictures in a two dimensional plane. Okay. I'm going to define this plane to start with. This is my x axis, and it's going to rain, range between 0 and 1. I'm going to have a y axis that ranges between 0 and 1, and I want to paint a pretty picture in this space. I will be the fitness function. I will decide whether I, I think this picture is pretty or not. Okay? We're going to use a CPPN to generate an image. HyperNeat is actually one of the very first generative neural networks. As you probably know, all state-of-the-art AI these days, Stable Diffusion, DALI, ChatGPT, these are generative networks. This is part of where they started. Yeah? Okay. What does, it, what does a CPPN do? Well, it has an input layer and an output layer like we've seen before. It also has a hidden layer. That's where the uh, similarity between networks 
uh, between CPPNs and networks we've seen before stops. What's new about CPPNs is what we feed to the input layer. In your robot, you're feeding into the input layer sensor values. If we have a neural network that's trying to recognize a dog or cat in an image, we feed pixel values to the input of the network. In this case, we're gonna feed in coordinates. In this case, X and Y coordinates inside this picture. Yeah? Okay, so let's create a hypothetical CPPN that has one neuron in it. Uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's got two input neurons, one for X and one for Y. And one output neuron, which I'm just gonna call G. This is just my nickname for it. It's not encoded in the network at all. And I'm gonna connect this input neuron to the output neuron with one synapse that has a weight of one. I'm gonna connect this neuron to this neuron with another synapse that has a weight of one. You remember that neurons also need activation functions, which is once I compute the weighted sum of the values arriving at this neuron, I push them through a function, and the, the value that comes out of that function is the value that is spat out by the neuron. Right? You remember the activation function? I'm gonna draw the activation function inside the neuron, and I'm gonna use the identity activation function. So my little axis inside here, the horizontal axis here, this is the raw weighted sum that's arriving in the neuron. I find where that, what that raw weighted sum is, and the y-axis tells me how to transform that weighted sum into a value that I spit out. If I'm using the identity activation function, then whatever the weighted sum is, I just spit that out. So far, so good? Okay, this is almost about as simple a network, neural network as you can make. Yeah, so far, so good? Okay, so um, let's, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna visit a whole bunch of positions inside this two-dimensional plane, and I'm gonna push the coordinates of each of those positions through this network. Let's go. Let's start at zero, zero. What does this network spit out? Zero. So G is going to stand for the amount of green that I'm going to leave at that position. So I'll just draw an outline here. G of zero means don't put any green there. Yeah? Okay, let's go to the next position, which is X equals 0.1 and Y equals zero. What does it spit out? 0 0.1. 0 0.1 times 1 plus zero times 1 is 0.1. Point one is the weighted sum. My, I'm using the identity activation function, so it receives point one, spits out point one. I leave a little bit of green. X, uh, point two, comma, zero. What does the network spit out? What happens as I continue visiting points uh, of increasing X? Leave more and more green. All right, let's test my artistic abilities here. Yeah? Okay, so you can see what the CPPN is doing. It's producing a pattern. That's why it's called a pattern producing network. Yeah? What about this next row? What happens at y equals 0.1 as I walk from left to right and feed in the coordinates to the CPPN? Same thing, but a little greener. Okay, run the CPPN in your brain and paint the rest of this image. What does it, what pattern does it produce? It's like a diagonal gradient. It's a diagonal gradient starting with the most green up here, one, one. It's about a, the maximum amount. And as we move to the bottom left, less, yeah? Okay, so we have a very simple network down here. It's a generative network. 
with, that's what we call it today. It generates a pattern here. It produces, it produces a pattern. This is not a random collection of pixels. It's not like you know, static noise, but painted in green. There's regular structure here. What regular structure is here? It's not random. There, someone mentioned it already. There's a gradient. As we move thing up to the upper right, things get darker. Yeah? OK, we're going to continue playing the CPPM game, but we're going to speed things up now. Imagine a mutation comes in and changes this synaptic weight from 1 to 0. Go. What does this CPPN paint? Right? It doesn't care about y anymore. So it doesn't matter where we are in terms of y. It's always going to paint the same pattern on the horizontal axis, which is more green as x gets bigger. If x is bigger, there's more green, and as x gets lower, there's less. Yeah? So we've mutated the CPPN, and it paints a different pattern. So far, so good? OK. So let's come back to the uh, projector here. You'll see there's this little cartoon picture of this bug, this insect. Insects are great because they have all sorts of regular structure in them. We're going to come back to CPPNs in a moment. CPPNs were designed not just to produce gradients, but to produce all the other kinds of regularity we see in nature, like repetition. We can paint little patterns at different positions inside our canvas. CPPNs are also capable of symmetry. For example, it can paint the same thing on the left that it paints on the right. And I'll show you how it does that in a moment. The same CPPN can do all of the above. The same CPPN can produce repeating patterns. It can produce symmetry. It can paint little individual things or little details that only appear once at one place in uh, the image, which again, we see in nature. You have one and only heart, one, one and only one heart. It's only one on one side of your body. Yeah? OK, so how, does, how, does, how do CPPNs produce repeated patterns? I'll tell you in a moment, but does anybody see how it might do that? There's a strong hint on the left side of the slide. It changes the activation functions. It changes the activation functions. So this is something we have not seen before. This is the other innovation about HyperNeat, is a mutation operator can mutate or change the activation function inside a neuron. So imagine a mutation operator, uh, a mutation event ch hits this neuron at random. Could have been this neuron or this neuron. And it replaces the identity activation <coughs> function here with a sinusoidal activation function. This sounds kind of weird. You, don't, you tend not to see sinusoidal activation functions in machine learning, but there's a reason for them in CPPNs. Now, depending on what the weighted sum is that's arriving at this neuron, it can produce more or less output. Yeah? OK, let's try it. Let's leave this network as is, where we basically have, we can ignore the y-axis here because we have a synapse of 0. As x increases, what does the G neuron, the output neuron, spit out? How does it spit out green as x increases from 0 to 1? Bands of lighter, darker, lighter, darker, lighter, darker. Absolutely, right? So I haven't said anything about the frequency of the sinusoidal pattern in here. But if the frequency is high enough, it'll produce repeating patterns. Yeah? So far, so good? OK, so that's where we get repetition from. Where do we get symmetry from? How does the CPPN, how could a CPPN produce symmetry? We want to produce a pretty picture. We want to, sorry, we want to create a CPPN that paints a symmetric picture. Everything on the left looks the same as everything on the right-hand side. 
rotate it around x equals 0.5. What do we need to do to the CPPN? The normal distribution is one-third x to the point five. You got it, right? So we're gonna mutate, we're gonna mutate the CPPN again. We're gonna change the activation function so that this neuron's maximal output is when the weighted sum arriving at this neuron is 0.5. Yeah? So now as we move from x equals zero to x equals one, minimal output, maximal output, minimal output. We have a bilaterally symmetric image. Question? Could you also do it the other way? So it's like a U. Absolutely, we can. Mutation comes in and does that. Yeah? Okay, a warning at this point. You can code up CPPNs and you will lose yourself. You will go down the rabbit hole. They're fascinating. You can evolve them to produce all sorts of amazing uh, images. There used to be a website where you could go and do this through an interface. You could evolve CPPNs and click on the images that you liked. And you become the fitness function. The website would delete all the CPPNs that produced images that you didn't click on. And it produced through CPPN, it uh, through NEAT, it produced offspring networks that produced similar pictures to the ones that you clicked on previously. Yeah? You can drive the process through clicks to evolve pretty pictures. Yeah? Again, this was one of the uh, origin points for stable diffusion and all the rest, state-of-the-art uh, AI painters at the moment. So far, so good? Okay, so we're a pretty long way from robotics at this moment. This course is about robotics. We're gonna bring it back to robotics, I guess, next time. Let's do a few more examples with CPPNs. How do we get from painting pretty pictures back to evolutionary robotics? What happens if instead of painting 2D pictures, I want to paint 3D pictures? I want to paint into a volume. So now it's not 2D. We have an empty cube, and I want to paint into that cube. I want to paint the voxels, which are the 3D pixels sitting inside of this cube. What do we need to do? Now I can visit regular 3D locations in the cube and it'll tell me how much green to generate or deposit at that point. So far so good? I wanna make a YouTube video. I wanna make a series of 2D frames and I'm gonna stitch them together in a video and upload it and impress my friends with my AI generated movie. How do you alter a CPPN to produce time varying images to produce a movie? You could just use the one you have already. You would be replacing the view with a time axis. Now I'm entering coordinates in space time. At every point in time, if you think of a video as a cube where two of the axes are space and the third axis is time, now I paint all the x and y's, but I hold t at zero, which gives me the zeroth frame in my video. Then I visit a whole bunch of x and y coordinates by setting t equal to one, and that'll paint a whole bunch of images uh, for my second frame, and so on. Everybody see that? Is it gonna work? Is it gonna produce regular patterns now, not in space, but also in time? Is frame I going to look similar to frame I plus one? I see a couple shakes and a couple nods of the head. Maybe we have to select for that. I could do something like this. I could start by setting t to zero, and at the next time, to uh, the next time I could set t to this to get my second frame. Then I could set t then to create my third frame. I would set t to this. I'm 
altering T by a small amount, and that would probably up the chances that there's going to be similar or regular change now across time. It's relatively easy to make smooth transitions across any of the space-time dimensions in uh, Hypernate. Quest pause for a moment. Questions, comments? Okay, we looked at 3D pictures, videos. I wanna paint a pretty picture in a hypercube, dimension four. How do I do it? Why I would do it is maybe not so clear, but bear with me for a moment. How do you know what that is? I assume it has another input maybe? Of course, right. So a tesseract or a four-dimensional uh, a four-dimensional cube, it's hard to visualize. You can visualize it as a whole bunch. You could watch a video of a cube changing over time. We could use that we could use T as the fourth axis. Hyperneat is called hyperneat because it can paint patterns into hypercubes. It can paint patterns into a structure of arbitrary dimension. Now again, why you would want to do that, it's not clear yet. And I'm gonna, I think probably gonna leave you on the hook here for a moment. Let's, we got four minutes left. Let's do a couple more examples. As you might have started to guess by now, Hyperneat has, has seen a lot of applications in robotics, but also in art. How about generating music? Any music aficionados here? You have a, a sheet of empty uh, sheet music, empty bars. You're gonna paint, you're gonna get a CPPN to paint music. Refer to the bits of how your output behaves. How the output behaves and also the input. What, what are the input coordinates for sheet music? Absolutely, right? So I, I can't read sheet music very well, but I do remember that it's on the horizontal axis is time, right? And the vertical axis is pitch, right? So I could visit particular points at a particular time, and the output could be whether or not a note is left at that position, right? Again, if there's any music aficionados here, bear with me. I, I don't know what I'm doing, but you get the basic idea, right? Leave a note here, don't leave a note here, Leave a note here, leave another note here, here, and so on, right? Now you have a CBPN that's painting music. I don't know if this is music you would want to listen to, but you can be guaranteed that it is not going to be a random collection of notes. There is going to be a regularity to this musical structure. So the result of those would be from the fitness function, right? We haven't talked about the fitness function yet. We're just talking about what CPPNs do, but great question. Let's finish with that today, right? What's the fitness function? At the moment, we've been talking about art and music, so fitness is gonna be subjective. It's hard, or no one's figured out yet how to write down a fitness function that selects for increasingly beautiful music. It's maybe not impossible, could be done. Easiest thing is subject someone to huge amounts of CPPN generated music, and they choose what survives and what doesn't. Again, you can code this up relatively easily. Last thing I wanna say about CPPNs before we break here, somebody mentioned this already, we're not forcing evolution to do anything. Evolution is gonna evolve populations of CPPNs against some fitness function. We are biasing evolution to produce regular patterns. You can also, it's not easy, but you could do it. You can construct a CPPN that will leave what looks like random noise in your structure. It can, CPPNs can also produce non-regular structure. In the space of all possible CPPNs, in the fitness landscape, recall our discussion about evolutionary algorithms, there are CPPNs that produce irregular patterns but CPPNs tends to bias evolution towards parts of the fitness landscape that include regular phenotypes, regular structure. What the fitness function does with that, we'll see next time. 
Have a good rest of your day. You have a quiz due tonight, assignment 10. Go check out embodied-intelligence.org and check out the Embodied Intelligence Conference. Have a good rest of your day.